just for the um, very rigorous academics, uh, all of my sources and quotes will be put on the PowerPoint, but I'm just going to explain what I'm arguing for, so you can fact check me here. But I, I don't have notes or anything. Uh, so intellectual history. It's actually widely misunderstood. The famous economist John Maynard Keynes once said that even the practical businessman who feels, though he ha who feels as though he has no debt to intellectualism still is enslaved to the ideas of some defunct economist. And this captures the idea that concepts and ideas can become the foundations for societies and can have practical consequences. Many people believe that's what intellectual history is. But that's just good history. Intellectual history inverses that process. Instead of looking for the consequences of an idea, you look for the causes of an idea. So you rifle through letters, you use linguistic arguments, you turn it, as Isaiah Berlin says, into a science. Unlike natural science, which seeks out universal laws of nature so that under certain condi conditions, you could argue that uh, an effect would be necessitated, Intellectual history as a science looks for a particular story. There's got to be a causal connection between the idea and uh, its predecessors, but you have to find the causal link yourself. You have to rifle through personal letters and show the evidence. I'll give you two examples really quickly and then jump into my presentation. So one form of intellectual history can focus on personal causes. And by personal causes, we're talking about causes that come from the person. So maybe something that expresses the idiosyncrasies of uh, somebody's psychology or character. Um, my, one of my favorite arguments comes from Simon Cohen of the University of Cambridge, who argues about Immanuel Kant. Immanuel Kant famously downplayed the role of emotions and elevated the role of reasoning when it came to our approach to morality. So that a truly moral action wasn't simply an emotional action, acting on some sense of love for your neighbor, but was a reasonable action acting in accordance with the law of reason. However, very few people know, or at least Simon Cohen argues, that Kant was actually autistic. So in a sense, Kant didn't have the same emotional, moral experience that many of us have, and so to make sense of morality, it helped him to use reasoning. Now this doesn't say anything about whether or not Kant's theory is right. Many non-autistic people subscribe to it, but it helps contextualize perhaps some of the motivations for the way Kant operated. Um, Another example, of course, is intellectual. Intellectual causes are causes that come from an idea to another idea. And that, of course, is my argument tonight. I'm going to be arguing that Rousseau transforms the divine will into a civic will. Uh, in particular, he transforms the general will into, from the will of God into the will of society. And um, I can't really expect you to understand this argument until I first present Rousseau. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to explain Rousseau's philosophy. It's a pretty detailed reading, but of course, uh, even a four-hour synopsis could not do justice to Rousseau's theory of freedom or the general will. Um, I'm, then, I'm then going to explain my argument by way of analogy. And then I'm going to conclude by offering the hard evidence that I believe justifies my claim. So what's Rousseau's argument? Rousseau's theory of freedom, uh, his initial foundation of freedom, is widely misunderstood. For Rousseau, you are only free, as Isaiah Berlin calls it, if you are the sole cause of your action. And Rousseau has almost a science about this. He believes that, uh, through the lips of the Savoyard vicar, he explains, I know that my will has an effect in this world. I can be the cause of effects in this world. Why? When I want to lift my arm up, I do. When I want to take a step forward, I do. So similar to Descartes, he believes that nature and animals alike can, be exp can have their actions explained in, the, in terms of the mechanisms of physics, but that human beings have a kind of dominion within a dominion. Human beings can actualize their will in this world and can have causes. This, for Rousseau, is freedom. Um, it's, by the way, nothing like someone such as Spinoza who says the will is an illusion uh, based on an inadequate understanding of the deterministic causes of what you're doing. So this scientific premise allows for an understanding of the will that is freedom for Rousseau. And this freedom brings moral significance to our actions. It brings moral significance to our actions in the sense, at least, that you can be responsible for the outcomes of your will. So that what Rousseau calls this is moral causation. And 
it's a bit complicated here, but essentially for Rousseau, in the initial state of, of nature, our will was used for good purposes. Our will was uh, used for taking care of ourselves through a self-love known as a mort de soi, which is simple. It's just men for Rousseau and nature lived in relative isolation from each other. If, I wanted, if they wanted to eat, they would eat. If they wanted to sleep, they would sleep. If they were uh, thirsty, they would drink, and so on and so forth. Just very simple, self-love has taken care of yourself. But Rousseau is a kind of theory of the fall, uh, though he doesn't use that language, in which this basic freedom, which brings moral significance to our actions, has been constrained by society. The socialization process has caused a problem so that there are at least two constraints on our freedom. The first, uh, I will explain, is external, and the second is internal. For external constraints, you can look to Rousseau's discourse on the origins of inequality, where essentially Rousseau explains uh, man's interaction with society as a kind of trick on behalf of the rich to deceive the poor into believing it's good to be subjugated to the will of another human being. So in this sense, external laws, which are not your own will, constrain your will. If I, uh, if I live in a society where an oligarch, a monarch, or a dictator decides what laws the society ought to have, and I'm forced to obey those laws without having any say, I'm constrained to the will of another human being. So I'm not free in a way that's a bit like being a serf or a slave, just because I'm not the sole cause of my actions. The other form of, con the other constraint on our freedom for Rousseau is, um, is a mort prop. This is the internal constraint on our freedom. A mort prop is actually very difficult to explain, so please forgive me. But essentially, whereas with a mort de soi, we would love ourselves through taking care of ourselves and basic subsistence, in a mort prop, my self-love comes through your eyes. I look at myself the way that I imagine you are looking at me. And I'm not simply content to know that you think I'm a worthy human being, but I need to feel like a superior human being. So for Rousseau, in a, um, he talks about, imagine a, a young man when, who first conceives of the fact that a girl may or may not be attracted to him. And he says, well, I wonder if she finds me attractive. But more importantly for him, I wonder if she finds me superior and more attractive to the men surrounding me. This creates, this un uncertainty about that creates an anxiety that is morally corrosive, can agitate the individual, is a source of avarice, might encourage him, for instance, to go beat up another man, to incur violence, simply to prove his superiority. So this amour propre constrains our freedom insofar as it prevents us from being able to act on our good selves, to act on our good will, and forces us to be compelled by these particular negative desires. So what does Rousseau do with this? Well, obviously, in Christianity, in a loose sense, you have the fall and you have redemption through God. For Rousseau, his brilliant move is to take the chains that bind us and enslave us, external and internal, and turn them into mechanisms for freedom. In the same way that a knife can be used both to cut food so that you can feed your family, it can also be used to stab your family. So the same thing can serve different functions. So <laughs> it's a bit of a grotesque example, I'm aware, but there we go. Um, the same thing can serve different functions. So first, the ex how the external forces of, how external force can force you to be free, and then how internal force can do the same. So external force, um, essentially for Rousseau, the idea is that you can make a contract with yourself, and the external force will compel you to be true to your will. Uh, a great example I got from Edmund Santuri is you can imagine somebody wants to go on a diet. So they rationally conceive of all the reasons. They want to lose weight, they want to be healthy. Maybe they, they're more patient if they eat healthier or better. And they ask you to help them go on a diet. And so, or maybe, let's make it me. I ask you to help me go on a diet. And you, you agree. But a few minutes after I ask for that, I see a bowl of cookies, and I'm overwhelmed by the ephemeral, transient desire to simply grab a cookie and eat it. I'm overwhelmed. I just want to ruin my own diet. When you take the bowl of cookies away from me, you forced me to be free, insofar as you forced me to stay true to my will, and you've acted on behalf of my own will. It's very complicated to fully understand this, so I'm, I'm going to offer a bit of an abstract analysis of the will that should help. Uh, you can imagine when somebody has uh, kind of a burial request, a way they'd like to be buried. It's their will to be buried that way. But of course, once they pass away, 
they're not there to act on the will. So somebody else acts on the will for them. So that the will is not the same as any particular desire. Or a different example with smoking. Um, I may have the desire to smoke. Well, I, I do have the desire to smoke. Um, but I'm actively suppressing it. My will is suppressing this transient desire to smoke. But in certain cases, I might be too weak to, be, to suppress my will, and I may need you to help. So just as I can suppress my will now, you can suppress my will when I'm incapable of doing it. You can suppress my desires when I'm incapable of doing it. So you can act on behalf of my will. Uh, there are other ways in which man can be forced to be free, Republican theories of liberty, etc. But this is uh, forced to be free from the individual perspective. This is the one that I care about. So that's external force. The second for internal. For how is it that you could take this vanity of a moh prop where you're looking at yourself through the eyes of those around you and turn it into a force for freedom? Well, Rousseau says that in the appropriate society, citizens might be motivated to be better people and to act in accordance with their own will if they know that their fellow citizens share the same values and will judge them for failing to live up to it. So in a sense, uh, here in this room, we all probably agree that drinking and driving is wrong. And maybe when I'm drunk at a party, I'm going to want to drink and drive. And I won't be afraid of the cops, because I'm too drunk. But I'm afraid of, of you judging me. And so your judging me is something I'm afraid of, so I don't drink and drive. So that the internal constraint can be something that compels you to be true to your own will. A, um, another example, another illustration is if I, I do debate, and I always wanted to be a good debater. And once I joined into a debate team and I was in a debate society, I was so motivated, motivated by the vanity of wanting other debaters to like me that I worked really hard. I was motivated, I worked, I was forced to actualize my will because I feared their judgment. Even though while I was actualizing my will, I was vain. I was very vain, very concerned with what, what everybody in that community thought of me. So, um, so I'd like to use, just to sum up this emote prop as a source of freedom, a quote from the English philosopher uh, Bertrand Russell, who said, don't try to live without vanity. That's impossible. Instead, seek the approval of the right audience. <laughs> so those are ways in which these forms of enslavement can become forms of freedom. But there's a particular way in which your will must be expressed. It's not just the same as uh, our will and nature. Now that we're in society, now that this is a, co a kind of collective action, you must express this will through your volonté générale and not your volonté particulière. So your volonté générale, which is a concept that can be debated for days, years, has been debated for years, about 200 probably, um, is the idea that you have the same will as your fellow citizens, so you want the same thing, you're bent towards the common good and not just to the individual good, and you are, um, yeah, you're bent towards the common good, and you are, it, it creates the, the will that's the force of the laws so that when you're in accordance with the general will, you're in accordance with your true will. So the general will is an enlightened will. The volonté particulière, your particular desires are unenlightened. But it's really important to clarify something. There are serious misunderstandings of volonté générale, even by some great Rousseau scholars. Um, one scholar, for instance, argues that the volonté générale is, about, is not about the individual. And so the word putting volonté générale, putting the general will, is deceptive since will seems to be associated very often with individuals. But it is about the individual. It's simultaneously about both the individual and society. What the volonté générale is distinguished from is the volonté particulière, which is the kind of transient ephemeral desires we talked about. Not the same as the individual, the desires of any individual. Is that okay? Are you guys clear? Great. It's very confusing, and I apologize for that. But here's where I begin to make my argument by way of analogy, just to give you a sense of what I'm going for. Um, for Rousseau, uh, so basically a lot of scholars, Joshua Mitchell, Christopher Brooke, Mike, Mike Hurl, have argued that Rousseau gives a kind of Christian narrative. But their arguments tend to come just by the parallels in the, in the two thoughts. Of course, you have as a beginning the, the fall for Rousseau, which he transposes from a theological problem to a political problem. And then you have, of course, the self for Rousseau. The self for Rousseau is a divided self. You have your uh, 
you have your mort prop and your mort de soi, you've got your, your good self and your bad self. And the idea is to, to, el to stick with the good self and not the bad self. Somebody like Pascal has a similar argument, but it comes in the form of sin. You've got the reasonable self, then you have the passionate self, and reasons have become sub subservient to passions and all of these different things. So that you have this basic understanding of the divided self, half of whom is free, the other half who is not. And the idea is to take, is to liberate yourself from yourself. That's the idea. That's a very Christian beginning. Um, and secondly, just keep going. And secondly, um, there's argue, uh, Joshua Mitchell recalls how the paradox is very, very similar. It's for Joshua Mitchell, I love this quote. He says, the intimity of freedom and servitude contained by the general will required in Rousseau a symbolic language that can express the paradox that a reconciliation of freedom and servitude would amount to. That symbolic language, that pattern of thought, though radically transfigured, is a kind of Christology. So for him, he thought that Rousseau was a lot like Luther, in that you would be subservient to Christ and liberated by that subservience. And this kind of paradox was a Christian understanding of freedom that Rousseau embraced. But Joshua Mitchell ends there, and he says, all I have to show is the parallel. I hope the pattern of thought has influenced Rousseau. And another scholar, um, and Christopher Brooke has, has pointed out that this parallel ends at grace for him. It ends at grace for him because for St. Augustine, grace is something that's unmerited by human beings. God will give you grace whether or not you deserve it on occasion, and it's get doled out in a way that's unintelligible to, to human beings. So that grace is about God, not about man. And of course for Rousseau, with his general will, uh, it's really about man. And Rousseau says that God gave us all the faculties we need for freedom, etc. It's not necessary that God continues to liberate us. So, um, so that's where he believes it stops. However, I completely disagree. I believe that's where the argument begins. Uh, and I use Auerbach to help me out here. So again, my argument is that Rousseau transforms the Christian theory of grace and turns it into a civic theory of grace. Uh, why I use Auerbach is because Auerbach was has an interesting proposition. Feuerbach, who's a German atheist, said that the problem with Christianity is that man has taken his own powers and externalized them to God. So where man is creative and free and loving, caring and merciful and intelligent, uh, he said those are God's qualities, and man is left with being weak and stupid and avarice and everything else that's negative. It's kind of captured in original sin. So for him, the project he wants to launch, a project that was taken on by Nietzsche, is to re-internalize powers that we had externalized to God. Now, Rousseau didn't read Feuerbach, but Rousseau did participate in a similar kind of activity. He took the Christian vehicle for grace and he made it man's. At this point, though, you've had nothing but airy-fairy fluff and speculation, but there's actually substantial evidence, mostly derived from linguistics, to show that God, that Rousseau did this. God, and, okay. Um, to show that Rousseau did this. And the way he did is, the general will before Rousseau, as a Harvard scholar, Patrick Riley, points out, was actually God's will. Here's the history behind the general will. The general will, uh, there was a debate that was launched about the general will off of a reading of St. Paul, where he says that God wills that all men be saved. So the question is, does God have a general will that all men be saved, or a particular will, so that he chooses which men would and would not be saved? This debate began with St. Augustine versus the Pelagians, and then was aired out for, between the Jansenists and the Jesuits. The Jansenists would re-articulate Augustine's position as best they can. So the first scholar to use the term volonté générale was Pascal in 1662. Um, and so Pascal says that he can trace the concept of the volonté générale to St. Augustine, and that the volonté générale is the good enlightened will, and the volonté particulière would be the negative will. But believe it or not, as famous as Pascal is today, in 17th century France, he was widely ignored by the major thinkers, Melbranche, Bosset, Nicole. People didn't care as much about uh, Pascal until Voltaire started excoriating him 100 <laughs> years later. So, if you mind going to the next. So the figure who really influenced Rousseau here is Melbranche. Not only did Rousseau read Melbranche, not only did Rousseau study under uh, neo-Melbranchians of his day, but Rousseau idolized and praised Melbranche. He says here, 
With Leibniz, Melvosh, and Newton, I demonstrate my reason in a sublime mode. I study the laws of objects and thoughts. With Locke, I study the history of ideas. So for Rousseau, Melbranche was one of the greatest thinkers of all time. And Melbranche had an incredible understanding of the general will that exactly parallels Rousseau's. Uh, in um, Melbranche's treatise on the nature of grace, he defends a very interesting form of the general will, but it's, it takes a second to explain. Essentially for Melbranche, he was motivated to defend the general will over the particular will because of his philosophy of science. I can't dive into it in full detail, but he essentially thought that um, God was the immediate cause of all actions. How is it that when I want to drink a, a glass of water, I think I want to drink a glass of water, my hand comes up to my mouth? The thought for Melvanche provides the opportunity for God to lift your hand up towards your mouth. And this is known as occasionalism, because different events provide the occasion for God to act. Uh, however, this has some serious repercussions. If, if Melbranche really makes this argument, then natural disasters, genocides, the illness of children are immediately caused by God. So how can you defend God having those immediate causes? Well, Melbranche argues, go to the next slide, in the treatise on the nature of, of grace, I actually think the argument's on the next one. Um, and then you can, that's just, on the treatise on the nature of grace, that the more enlightened will is the will that works by simple causes and is generalized, opposed to the will that works by particular causes. So Melbranche says the volonté générale is God's will. And because God has general laws and not particular laws, he wills into effect actions that we would consider bad, natural disasters, etc. But not only does he do that when it comes to science or natural phenomenon, he does that when it comes to men. God wills the general salvation of man. His general will is for man to be saved, but his particular will is not. And so this launches, and just go back to the last slide, slide actually. Uh, this launches a huge debate. Most people seriously disagree with Mendelssohn. You have uh, Bale and Leibniz and um, Patrick. You have everybody commentating on Mendelssohn about this general will, particular will, and whether or not the general will is vastly superior. Now, according to Patrick Riley, this debate was then politicized. So the general will became a political term. Um, and it became a political term through uh, Montesquieu and Diderot. But the problem is, the way that Montesquieu used the general will is nothing like the way that Melbranche and Rousseau used the general will. For, Melbranche and Rousseau, uh, for Montesquieu, the general will was the legislative will, the will that legislated a law. And the particular will was the judicial will, how you would decide who was and was not guilty of committing a crime, for instance. So Montesquieu argued that you have to separate the two powers. This, of course, has an influence on the American system, where Congress legislates and the ju judicial branch determines who's guilty and innocent of crimes. So that you have to divide those two powers. And though he's politicized the general will here, and Patrick Riley argues he's likely done this to elevate the prominence of his theory, by co-opting terms about divinity, which in 17th and early 18th century France is the stuff to talk about, uh, he would get more attention for his theory. But it's not the same. So what's amazing is the fact, and just go on, um, what's amazing is the fact that for Rousseau, the general will is the good, enlightened will, the enlightened will of an agent, and the particular will is the negative will, such that Rousseau literally takes Melbranche's version of the general will. I'm not talking about Diderot. Um, takes Melbranche's version of the general will and rearticulates it. And just as I said, he transmogrifies it from God to man. So I'm getting to my conclusion now. This long lecture is coming to an end. Um, I like this quote from, uh, this isn't a quote, by the way, it's a paraphrasing. Um, but after Rousseau's books were burned in Paris and Geneva, uh, he wrote letters from the mountains. And he essentially argued that Civic religion was the best form of religion, the kind of religion you might find in Sparta or Rome, and that Christian religion was bad because though it made good men, it made them bad citizens because of their otherworldliness. So perhaps what Rousseau really is doing is taking the best of Christianity, reinterpreting it, and making it a part of this world instead of a part of a world above.
Are there any uh, questions? Yes. Well, I, I have not heard the term occasionalism, so this is new to me, but, but it sounds a little like, I mean, it sounds something like Calvinism in the sense of the absolute sovereignty of God in every single particular. And of course, we know where Rousseau was born, which was Geneva, Geneva yeah. which is Calvin's town. And yeah. do you have anything to say about his intersection with Calvinism? I do. Um, Pamela Mason, who's a great Rousseau scholar, argues that Rousseau's being raised in Calvinistic G Geneva and then returning to Geneva gives us reason to believe that if you can draw the parallels between his thought and Calvinism, you can say that his thought was influenced by Calvinism. Um, and she has a wonderful argument, things like you know, the whole of the society being one in Calvinistic thought, the whole of the society being one in Rousseau's thought. However, where I depart from Pamela Mason's work is that I, I'm looking for more clear kind of intellectual engagements. I'm treating Rousseau not as a child who's influenced by a popular culture, but when he was a man, what was he studying? Who was he reading? How did those influence his thoughts? And somebody like Melbranche, who's an Augustinian of sorts, uh, it was not Calvinistic. So I, I see it as more likely that this Augustinian philosophy was influencing him rather than the Calvinistic philosophy. But of course, Calvinism plays a huge role. Yeah. In intellectual, in the study of intellectual history, um, how do you separate the descriptive from the evaluative components in terms of like, um, in the majority of the time you're just stating um, how, how, how one idea became the next, yeah. but for those who um, want to make um, evaluative claims, um, but you have this long history where um, the, 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 the idea has been changing for uh, multiple times throughout, uh, as you've shown really well with um, this idea of the general will. How, how do you begin to like, separate those two or, or relate those two? Well, for, I'll give you an example in a second, but for intellectual history, your goal is descriptive. It's not evaluative. You're not, uh, for, you're not trying to make an argument about the worth of anybody's theory. You're just making an argument about where it came from. So it's uniquely descriptive in that sense. And it can help you to use intellectual history uh, to understand an author. One, one example that I like is, um, you know, if, if it's true that, that Rousseau was co-opting this general will from God's will to, and making it a human will, then it can help resolve some of the debates within Rousseauian philosophy or between Rousseau scholars. Some argue that the general will is um, might just be kind of whatever the democracy decides, whatever all of the citizens agree with, that's the general will and that is right. And some argue that the general will is a kind of transcendent will that citizens through a, uh, through a decision-making process will come to select, right? Or discover. Um, so th that's a, a pretty big problem. But that problem also applied to God's will as well, where um, I don't know if you know Plato's Euthyphro, but essentially it says, um, is something good because God wills it, or does God will it because it's good, mm -hmm. right? Uh, theoretically, if it's good because God wills it, genocide could be good. If God wills it because it's good, then maybe you could skip the middleman. So, uh, Men Blanche argued that the good and God's will are co-eternal with each other, so that it's not, God wills something because it's good, and it is good because God wills it, but they're co-eternal. And I think that Rousseau could have a similar understanding of the general will. The general will is the enlightened and the good will. It's a particular kind of will. But it's also the kind of will you will discover through democratic processes. And it's going to be made good through your willing it. Yes? So I have a question about Malbranche, <coughs> sorry. Yeah. Um, so it seems like in your analogy, which is interesting, um, so the general will is supposed to be an analog from the sort of the divine case in Malbranche. Mm -hmm. It seems like the problem of, say, natural evil or even moral evil mm -hmm. can be just interpreted as ways in which political societies go wrong by, by having general policies or general laws. There's mm -hmm. bound to be you know, evil that comes out of this, but now it's just a result of the general secular will, so to speak, the political version of it. Mm -hmm. You have an explanation for, so to speak, political evil or injustice, which is right. in this analogy. Do you see this descriptive element uh, in, his, in his capacity to take over the analogy? Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. I mean, part of the problem with Rousseau is he doesn't envision the general will being enacted today in modern society. So his explanation of evil in this world is not Mel For him, evil is a 
product of our socializing with each other, where we develop these bad external laws and this bad emo prop. But um, he envisions when the general will is actualized for human beings, a kind of future period where everybody has been sufficiently well educated to accept the general will. I do think that there would be cases where something kind of negative uh, can be justified because it's part of the general will. For instance, he says um, that if you don't vote for a law, and even if you completely disagree with the law, um, it might still be the general will that you subscribe to, so you're still forced to be free to your own will, even though for some reason maybe your bad cognitive faculties has prevented you from seeing why it's in line with your general will. So you can explain certain minor cases of evil, for instance, being uh, evil for him being kind of like slavery to another. Um, that would be the best way that I could transpose the analysis. But I do think that the theodicy question probably divides them. Anyone else? Taylor? the only way to uh, sort of understand a world prop and uh, like, do you think there's another way to understand it besides Rousseau? Well, to understand a world prop besides Rousseau? Yeah. Uh, there could be. Pascal wrote about a world prop, as did Montesquieu. Um, but it, they all share a similar understanding of the term. They don't share the same genesis, but a world prop is essentially a, a, a source of our avarice desires and the expression of our negative form of self-love. Um, so the distinction between the general and the particular will isn't one that um, I've, I've heard it. Um, I've heard the will distinguished in that way. What do you think um, led to that extinction in intellectual history, or or how is it um, transmuted into our understanding today? Uh, what do you mean? Could you clarify? Sorry. Um, just the, the, so uh, Rousseau has this big idea of the general and particular will uh -huh. that um, he received that was going on through the ages. Yeah. And so it seems intuitive that like if this is such a big thing, that it would continue forward. But um, in my understanding, I haven't heard of this distinction before. And so right. I was I was wondering if you could um, maybe point to to where where that gap um, has taken place. Right. The particular terms general and particular will aren't used as much today except for in Rousseau scholarship, but the ideas have had tremendous impacts. Earlier I talked about Montesquieu. Um, many know that Montesquieu influenced the US Constitution and the division of powers so that Congress is legislating on behalf of the general will and um, the judicial bodies will determine who's guilty or innocent on behalf of the particular will, the particular judgment. Um, so you see it here, you see it within the United States in our political system. Uh, and I think in general as well, it's kind of a defense of, a good defense of democracy. Uh, that democracy is about allowing for the people to will into effect what it is the majority believes to be right. So the general will is kind of a democratic principle. So I would argue that through the division of powers and the modern adoration of democracy, you can see effects of this theory, but it's not a term that's still used at all. And, and it's not been actualized in the way that Rousseau had hoped it would someday be. Yes, please. Um, so um, what does, does or would Rousseau do with the idea of civil disobedience? Civil disobedience. This is great. This is a, uh, okay. This, so in a time like 17, uh, 18th century France, civil disobedience might be a great thing. But the society Rousseau envisions, and he writes about this on his writings on the government of Poland and in Emile, is a society where everybody's been so educated that they're all <laughs> essentially selecting the appropriate laws. Mm -hmm. So civil disobedience would be far less appropriate in that case. Mm -hmm. But one thing that's interesting is uh, one of the ways that you can be forced to be free is through not being encouraged to act in civil disobedience when you're in the right society. This is the um, Republican theory of freedom. So uh, Quentin Skinner writes about Republican theory of freedom, which he originates with uh, slavery in Rome. And the Republican theory of freedom is that you're not subject to the will of another human being, then you're free. And one problem in society is that maybe if we don't get our way, we get so upset about not getting our way that we want to destroy the society we live in. But if you live in the right society and you force that society to collapse through constant civil disobedience and aggregated movements of that kind, 
then you would relinquish your Republican freedom. So being forced to obey the laws is a form of being forced to preserve your Republican freedom. Since once the society, society collapsed, you may go back again into an asymmetrical power relationship with another human being. Well, I think that answered my follow-up question. So if cases of civil disobedience take place, it's more the fault of the individual than the society, assuming you have a proper society? Yeah, I mean, this is the most, this is, yes. I, in the proper society, um, yes. But civil disobedience, if you were, I mean, if we would just kind of abstract and imagine a great proper society, what would civil, civil disobedience be if all the laws were, were just and expressions of the will of all the members of society? If you had, uh, civil disobedience could be rape, for instance, you know, because rape is illegal and you rape, so you're, you're participating in civil disobedience, but that's not good. Though it's subversive, and we have a great sense of what civil disobedience is when the laws are unjust. In a society where the laws are just, I don't think civil disobedience is as good of a value. Yes, so my understanding of the general will then is largely built in reference to this future society where everything's kind of, where it's a proper society. And I see there being like a strong analogy, I guess, almost to more to the eschaton than the idea of like uh, the actions of God in society as it stands today. I was wondering whether or not Rousseau had any opinions on how an individual should act in relation then to the will of society as they now stand, and whether or not he was concerned that uh, his views might replicate the same otherworldliness that he finds in Christianity, except in the form of political idealism. Okay, so you've got you've got two questions then. Um, how do you act in a bad society, and is he running the risk of embracing otherworldliness as much as Christianity does? Right. Okay, well, um, in the bad society, Rousseau says it's really the virtuous man who has contempt for his fellow man, not because. He hates his fellow man, but because he hates the way they're currently behaving. So he's very much a revolutionary. And many people say the discourse on the origins of inequality uh, had a tremendous impact on the French Revolution, helped motivate the French Revolution. So he'd be for a kind of subversion of the current state of society. Um, however, as far as the otherworldliness critique goes, I do think that it's really important to stress that the basic philosophy Rousseau imports, I, I find it to be incredibly accessible. And it's about this individual freedom and this, and this general will that would be a material freedom. And he points to, as I've said before, Sparta and Rome and leaders like Numa and Lycurgus. And he says that these are the ideal examples. Those are places where they have civic religion. So as long as you can appropriately cultivate civic religion, you could then uh, sort of avoid the problem of otherworldliness. You wouldn't be focused on the gods above. You'd be focused on the here and now. And Rousseau was, by the way, a deist. He wasn't, he wasn't atheist at all. Yes? I'm wondering about um, how Rousseau's notion of the general will would be, um, how it would contrast with, say, consequentialism. I mean, you bring up um, Malebranche and the idea that God wills um, mm -hmm. evil things because in the long run or on the whole, mm -hmm. they produce a greater good. Mm -hmm. And so they're justified, I take it, they're supposed to be justified by it because, yeah. you know, Leibnizian fashion brings up the greatest possible. Mm -hmm. um, how, I, I take it Rousseau's general will doesn't just mean yeah. um, will the greatest good for the greatest number. That's Right, of course. Not, so yes. how, how exactly does Rousseau's conception of general will differ from that? Yes, well, uh, two things. First, for, for Melbourne, one of the justifications of the general will instead of the particular will is that the general will is the enlightened, morally superior will. So it's not simply that it has the best consequences, but it's the right kind of will. So the goodness stems from what kind of will it is as well. And as you probably know, uh, Rousseau is similar to Kant in that he places a premium on having the appropriate will. So Rousseau is not going to argue that um, in a utilitarian fashion, or maybe in Adam Smith's case, something like, you know, individual greed could create these good consequences and everybody would be, uh, you know, happier because of it. He would say, no, individual greed, if it's the motor of your society, is leaving you in a state of slavery. That's a no problem. Mm -hmm. You have the wrong will. So you need to have this will in order to truly be free for yourself. Uh, 
So it definitely goes beyond just consequentialism. But I, I do think you could make a similar argument for Metacolosh as well. Do you have some story about how we how we identify what the enlightened will, the, the manner in which the um, Does, enlightened uh, will would or would not? Rousseau. Is Rousseau, does he have a story about how we would identify the enlightened will? I mean, you, well, let me, let me yeah. phrase it a different way. You suggested, um, you referred once to the particular will as, as uh, the, the, the transient or ephemeral of things yeah. I sort of want in the moment. Of course, one can have long-term yes. set yeah. um, desires that Rousseau would consider yes. evil. So does he have a general story about how we distinguish between what's really particular but maybe long-standing particular desires and what really counts as uh, a will that's in accord with the general will? Yes, and I, I hope I'm not abusing your question, because you're right. I must first confess that when I explained Rousseau, I tried to cut it down and make it as quick as possible. But, uh, but the particular will is not just those transient desires. I believe the best way to look at it, um, in Rousseau's case, is that you might have a, you know, with a mohawk prop, this is a long-standing kind of condition of vanity as well. So you might have a long-standing will to simply continually try to be superior to others. And a mohawk prop, though it's always a part of your will, is never a good part of your will. So your enlightened will is the will that you kind of, and I'm giving a Kantian tinge to Rousseau here, but you kind of rationally sanction. If uh, you have you know, a sense of pity for others arise within you, what matters is whether or not you determine that it's right to act on that sense of pity or you reject it. So that general will is what you rationally sanction as the right will. And that long-standing will that's still a particular desire can be something like a moral prop, but it's not by any measure enlightened. So you have to make use of it instead of see it has your form of freedom. Is that useful for you? Yeah. Is that okay? Anyone else? Well, I'll just out here. I, I, this is a wild card question. He was an eccentric, notoriously so. And I just wonder if in this wonderful, harmonious society there's any need or room for acting out in any kind of, like, he wore strange yeah. dress. Yeah. He, he even seemed to attract attention to himself. Yeah. And then complain about the people who were targeting him with the negative attention. And, yeah. Um, but, but. I'm just wondering if there's any room in this world of his for people who want to act a little different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I want to I wanna actually take that opportunity to give a story that Rousseau wrote about in the Confessions, um, where he apparently went up like on a farm or something and exposed himself nude to a bunch of women. And then he was chased down. When he's finally caught, he said, you may not believe it, but I couldn't think of anything to say. And he has this <laughs> you know, fascinating, quirky side to him. Um, and that would, you know, that's, kind of, that's definitely his, his personality. I, I think that a will towards the common good is not necessarily a will that um, tries to push pluralism or individualism down in any particular sense for things that might be conceived of as morally neutral but it tries to elevate your ability to hold yourself to your true will mm -hmm. and elevate the sort of general laws that are put into society and what you're willing to do for society. So something that's silly, I'm sure there'd be room for it. I couldn't imagine him excluding it. Mm -hmm. uh, and if there is no room for it, then there's just a distinction between his personality and his philosophy. Yeah. I think that will be all for today. But I'm very gr glad that you came. Thank you so much.